because it's not due yet, right? Yeah, it wasn't really hard. Um, at least I don't think so. <laughs> I think I got the wrong. But. Questions about 3-40? Here's homework for, from last. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I just still some questions, but do you have some more questions, Chief? Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. Okay. I didn't quite understand. Maybe we could go through the actual uh, algorithm just a little bit. And then the programming is a separate issue. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. The issue that I'm struggling with on that one, and it's not a big one, I'll figure it out, is, is just, you know, what exactly do they want? Because I can turn this problem on its head three different ways. What exactly they want is they want the distribution of x given y equals 44,000 times. Yes, but do you, okay. So x is discrete uniform on 1 to 100. 1 to up to 100. I'll try to write it this way. Okay, and it's set. Okay. And given um, x equals little x, or and then I have y, I'll write it this way, y given x equals little x, okay, it's uniformly it's, distributed. It's, it's, it's discrete uniform. Yeah. On one, two, up to x. Okay. All right. So we know what the probability of y equals y given x equals x is. So actually, what we know is that the probability that of y given x little y slash little x. This is a frequency function. Conditional frequency function is. Um, 1 over x for y between 1 and x, and it's 0 else. All right, so for each fixed x. Okay. Um, now, what they want, though, they want to simulate not this. Okay, they want to simulate the, the they want now to compute uh, the probability of x given y, little x given y, what's that? That is equal to uh, the joint probability mass function, px y, divided by the marginal, v y. All right, so that's the definition. This is what they want, and they have an algorithm for computing it. Well, let's see. How would I actually get the numerator? The numerator would be equal to the right the other way. This is basically a, a phase rule calculation. P y given x y slash x times p sub x of x. Okay, over. Uh, and on the bottom will be written exactly the same way, um, only with a sum for all x. Um, well, maybe I'll just write it this way, shorthand first. But you sum on x. Okay. So I could write, maybe I should write it this way. See how it's going. So this would be the sum x greater than or equal to y of the same thing, p y given x, little y given x, piece of x of x. Okay. I'm just shifting a little bit. Okay. So there it is. Um, x greater than y up to 100. So you fix your y in your algorithm, you might as well just assume that y is 44. Little y is 44. And then little bit, and then the so what's the algorithm that says? The algorithm that tells you is generate first algorithm for simulating a random variable with, prob with frequency function, random variable x, with frequency function, I guess you call it x1. Or x sub 44 with frequency function uh, px 
given y, little x given 44. Okay, that's what I want. First, what you do is you generate a discrete uniform on 1 to 100. Okay? So basically, you're, you're bringing in this frequency function. Okay? Step one generate. X according to the discrete uniform on 1 to 100. Okay? Step 2. Accept X with probability. Um, Y given X, they put it in the book. What they meant is this. Okay. you accept, then terminate. Okay? Otherwise, go to step A. If it's three, if, if accepted, terminate. Uh, then print X. Then print X. Okay? Otherwise, uh, go to step one. What they really mean here is that first, x has to be bigger than y. I right, should put, I'll just go ahead and put the 44 in here now. Okay. So what they mean is, if x is bigger than 44, okay, then you have a chance of accepting it. Okay. But you still only accept it this probability. And this probability is simply what? <coughs> 1 over capital X. Okay. Okay. So, so generate X. If X is bigger than 44, then, it, then see, because otherwise this, this probability is 0. If X is less than 44, this probability is 0. Uh, I see. Accepted, then you, then you go ahead and take that as your x value and continue on. Okay. So, what percentage of the time are actually going to print an x value? 57. Well, I mean, this is, I guess how many times? Uh, what percentage of the time am I actually? This is this is the this is the percentage of the time that I'm actually going to. Uh, let's see. This is my acceptance probability, right? Mm -hmm. Fifty-six. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, this is this is by one over a hundred. This is summation x greater than or equal to forty-four to a hundred. This is uh, 1 over x, and this is 1 over 100. 
So this is a, and so this we calculated last time, we said this is about 0 0.8, 0 .C, 0 0.83 divided by 100, 0 0.0083. That's actually the probability that I'm going to accept. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Is that right? I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Well, actually, that's not the probability of accepting each run. Is that right? I hate this problem. Okay. Give it to us. Let's see. Um, Let's see, I'm going to generate x. Okay, what, what percentage of the time am I actually going to, roughly what percentage of the time am I actually going to accept x? Let's see. x could be anything between 1 and 100. Okay, so um, if, if it's less than 44, I'm not going to accept at all. So that's about half the time I don't accept, right? And then, uh, so it's actually not quite this. This, well, what's well, point? This is not the probability we accept, I don't believe. Okay, that's what this denominator is. Um, okay, so what, how does it work out? Um, and then so it's some kind of average, basically, of the numbers 1 over uh, 44 to 1 over 100. Is basically the portion of the time that I'm going to accept. Right. Times about one on one half for the times that I actually that I get x bigger than 44. Okay, because there's two ways I can fail here. Either x is not bigger than 44, okay, or then I'm only going to accept it with a certain probability. So somewhere between, basically, it's one over a half times. It's going to be one over two times one over 60, something like that. It's about one out of 120 times I'm actually going to accept. So it works out. So the, your criteria for acceptance is simply pick a number, pick a random number, and if, if it comes up right, then you accept that value. Otherwise, you don't. No, well, I would say only with a certain probability. Well, right, and, and, and you'd have to generate that probability. You have to figure out how you're going to accept it with only a certain probability in your program. Right, right, right. Okay. That's a programming issue. But what do you get this? So, so roughly 1 out of 120 times, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to accept. Okay, so I'm going to waste 120 samples for every x generated to the point. Okay. How did you get that 120? Roughly 120. I'm, I actually do calculate the 120. Um, because you generate x, you're going to accept about 56% of the time for the first one. That's the reciprocal of this number, okay? So actually this was correct, it's the probability of the extent. It's the reciprocal of this point, 0, 0, 8, 3, it's 119. the actual percentage of the time that I'm going to accept. It's less than 1% of the time. So you have a run. You know, it's not a very big chance. Okay. Is this a help? This is enough detail, I think. So I see how it's going. So then I have to just basically do it. I have to, have, I have to generate x. Then I actually have to do this process of accepting. This is the only part of the program. It's difficult. Yeah. Okay. If x is less than 44, just throw it away. Okay. If x is bigger than 44, then I have to say accept only with this probability, 1 over x. How do you do that? How do you accept with the probability? That's easy. Okay. So yeah, that's there's an easy way to do it, basically. All right. There's, that's the only hard part of the program. But you just write some little loop that says, well, one out of, one out of x times, I, I take you. All right. I see where it's going. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I guess.
guess one of the things I struggled with in the, in the English description of what they wanted was they wanted this run a thousand times. Yeah, they wanted a thousand X's. So basically, you oh, need okay. 119,000. You need 119,000 okay. runs, roughly. If you keep a count of yeah. you will see okay. this many runs. Sure. Okay. So so you got to get yeah a thousand acceptances is basically what you're looking for. Okay. Okay. You need a thousand acceptances. Okay. 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 Good was Maple was, oh, was going to take forever. It was probably cracked. This is <laughs> Matlab. Matlab will do it. Okay. Man, it took like 10 minutes. I didn't see a result when I typed in about a okay. number that big. All right. Okay, so why don't we go on? That was kind of a fun problem. It's a good problem, computing problem. I assume that you'll be able to, you'll be able to, problem number 37 is a little bit easier, okay? Where you just have to apply the rejection method. You don't have to do this probability stuff. So it's a lot easier, okay, to do that because you just compare two numbers, right? Because there you actually are, see, you actually have to do two random picks in order to get this acceptance thing. So I only had to make one random pick here, right? Then somehow I have to, in order to do this probability, I have to make another random pick. All right. Well, whereas in the rejection method, you automatically take two random picks. You have the interval a, b, and you have the interval zero to m. Okay. And you take two random picks right at the start, and you generate a point. Okay. And if the point is above the curve, you reject it. If it's below the curve, you accept it. Yeah. So you take your two random picks right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a little easier to see. Yeah. Okay. How do you show this graphically? Because I don't see it graphically. That's what bothers me. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe it is just the rejection method. You probably can just apply the rejection method here. Okay. And that's what you were doing, I think. That's now, what you were doing. That's, that's what you were on. Yeah. That's what um, I did. So I, that's okay. what I wanted. So yeah. uh, <laughs> let's see. How would I do this? Let's see. Well, excuse me. No. But this time they wanted actually a conditional density. They wanted a conditional density, not the, the original density. Uh -huh. That's why it's a little bit different. I think I won't go through it for a picture right now. We could generate something, I'm sure. That's a challenge to me for next time. Okay? Give your hand off. Computing. I thought it was a good section on this computing these middle problems here in the chapter just to get a feeling of what conditional density is. The author really went pretty deeply into it. Um, more so than I think many other authors would. I'm going to skip the bivariate normal distribution for now because I don't want to slow them up. Maybe we should talk about the Bayesian problem, though, because that is in your homework for this week. Yep. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Let's go ahead and look at um, the Bayesian inference problem. Got into this by flipping a, or spinning a one euro coin, and uh, it's foreign enough currency to determine whether there was a, a higher percentage of heads and tails. So the Bayesian approach is to go ahead and uh, state your some kind of make some kind of statement about your knowledge about the parameter of the, of the uh, family of distribution. So if we were going to toss a coin, then we have um, toss a coin n times. Uh, then, then, then we can think of the density or the frequency function. Is the following formula f x uh, slash theta, okay? Yeah, 
says n choose x theta to the x 1 minus theta to the n minus x x equals 1 2 through n where x is the total number of heads uh, that's a frequency function for x equals the total number of heads that appear on a coin it has just two possibilities one heads or tails okay this is how you can write the frequency function I kind of wrote it out as if it were a density function to write a formula for it but of course x is a discrete parameter x goes from 1 to n so 1 to n corresponds to the interval of course uh, that's easy to find and so for each uh, and theta is the probability of heads So what I have is a binomial frequency function, i.e., x is binomial with of size n and frequency parameter theta. Okay. So that's how I could denote all possibilities. I don't know what theta is, though. So what the Bayesians do is they give you some um, prior distribution of theta. They'll say, well, maybe I'm totally ignorant about theta, so I'll assume that theta is uniform on the unit interval. I have, this could be anything. That would be the model of ignorance. Or maybe I have already some data and I got some sense about it. If, you know, I should give more of a peaked distribution. Uh, the theta is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7, really. It was a slight possibility that it's less than that, so I might choose something that, um, so for the theta density, I might choose something that's more, you know, has a peak in the middle somehow. Now, how would they do that? Okay. So, I'll call this F sub capital <coughs> theta of little theta. It's the density of theta. Okay. Capital theta, I said I made basically a capital H with a circle around it. So there's, this is what I know my conditional x given theta is. So I can write this, I can, so with a Bayesian approach, I can write this like that. Given that I know what th capital theta is, this is what the density of x will be. But how do I know what little theta is going to be? So the point is to go ahead and do some kind of prior information, run your experiment, and then actually calculate the, uh, the posterior distribution of theta given x. Depending on what I get it out from my experiment, how many heads I get, then that will revise the, d the uh, density of theta. In other words, I get a conditional distribution density of theta given x. So what you actually have here is a mixture, because what they're going to do, theta is a continuous parameter, X is a discrete parameter, so they have kind of a mixture of discrete and continuous, but the method works as if they were both continuous densities. Um, let's go ahead and just follow, do the example as the author did it, because that's the easiest thing to think about, I think, first. So, did I, I didn't do this already, did I? I don't think so. So let, uh, uh, F sub theta of theta equal 1 for 0 less than theta less than 1 and 0 else. So just the uniform density. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to assume that my, my prior density is uniform. <laughs> uniform prior. So it's easy to update with this with this camera because it just automatically updates, right? Um, then what is the um, what's the first in order then find with this situation find the posterior distribution theta given x. All this tackle on here. Well, remember what that 
is, that is the joint density divided by the marginal density of x, or the marginal frequency function in this case, what is the joint density? The joint density is you have to, um, how do you get the joint density? Well, you get the joint density by multiplying the original uniform prior times this conditional density of x given theta multiplied these two together. Okay, that gives you the joint density. And then you sum out the theta to get the marginal density of x. So this is simply equal to n choose x, theta to the x, 1 minus theta to the n minus x, x equals 1 to n, and theta between 0 and 1 is 0 else. Okay, divided by the sum of that thing, overall theta, and now that's going to be a continuous sum. Okay, integral 0 to 1, n choose x, theta to the x, 1 minus theta to the n minus x, d theta. So then the question is, how do you do this integral down here? I want you to take it to the really good way to do it. Let's see. <laughs> Faith for now, and then I'll show you how I've kind of gotten out of it. Okay, by my notes today, if we get that far. Maybe next time. So, what I need to know is some kind of integral. I need to know the following I need to know the integral that theta to the a minus 1, 1 minus theta to the b minus 1, d theta, from 0 to 1. This integral is tabulated. Books, okay, is equal to gamma a gamma b over gamma a plus b. Actually, so if I actually take this function of theta on the unit interval, okay, for fixed a and b, and I divide this this expression by this constant, again, yeah, I'm thinking a and b is constants here, and I divide by this constant, I actually get a density, right, called the beta density, and that is something we skipped from chapter two. It's back there in chapter two. The beta density is stuck in a little corner right up to the gamma, probably. Um, oh, maybe this one later than yeah, this little paragraph on it. Somewhere. All right, there it is. Beta density, yeah, this little paragraph. Beta density is useful for modeling random variables that are restricted to the unit interval. And he just writes it down. All right, on page 58. Where he talks about the beta density f of u equals u to the, I guess he uses alpha and beta because that's usually the way it's done. Alpha minus 1, 1 minus u to the beta minus 1 uh, times gamma alpha plus beta over gamma alpha gamma beta. Uh, u, 0 less than u less than 1, that's a density called beta density. It's going to come arise uh, several times in the next seven months. Okay, and it's also going to arise here a little bit. So it turns out this is it just turns out that this is the right normalization factor in order to make this total integral integrate to one, which is equivalent to this thing. So here A has to be positive and B has to be positive. These they can be continuous parameters if you like. Here they're going to be just where we're going to apply this is they're going to be discrete parameters. Because 
X is now playing the role of A um, plus, let's see, no, this is X, so A minus 1. A minus X is playing the role of B minus 1. It's just done with A minus 1, B minus 1, and that's the way it's always done. So you get the gamma formula, so you don't have the pluses and minuses in the gamma. Okay? So we're going to use that, this, this fact, this formula that integral, that family of integrals. And so you simply get, uh, these n, n choose x is now a constant. That's just going to factor out. The only thing that's being integrated here is with theta. That's just a constant. That's going to factor out. You have this at the top. You have some number down here. What is the number? Well, it's this number. <laughs> OK. What did I say? So uh, <coughs> x is a minus 1. So gamma of a is going to be x plus 1. A, the A will be x plus 1. So A equals x plus 1. And the B is going to be n minus x plus 1. And the A plus B is therefore going to be n plus 2. Okay? In this integral situation. So I'm simply going to get theta to the x, 1 minus theta to the n minus x. Um, and then I have to divide by this number, which was gamma of x plus 1, gamma of n minus x plus 1. Then I'll put the other stuff. And then the denominator of this, I'll put it in the numerator, gamma of n plus 2. So actually what this comes out to be is um, x equals 1, 2, 3, up to n. I'm sorry, the x goes from 0 to your binomial. I'm sorry, I got stuck on that other one. <coughs> X goes from zero. Okay. So that is, well, this is a density for each X, a density in theta for each X equals one, zero through ten. Okay, so I get different densities depending on what x is. All right, so I'm going to actually come up with an x when I do my experiment. I toss the 20, he tosses the 20 euros, and he gets 13 heads. Right? Let's say. So let's say for n equals to 20, he gets x equal to 13. Experiment. n equals to 20, let's say, say x equals 13 heads. Okay? Up here. Then what do I get for my posterior density? Then my posterior density of theta is f theta given x theta slash 13 equals theta to the 13, 1 minus theta to the 7. Uh, I have a gamma of 22, which is 21 factorial. <coughs> 21 factorial, over, I mean, over the right factorials in order to make it a beta density, right? 21 factorial over uh, 13 factorial, and um, that's 7 factorial. Is that right? Uh, n minus x is 7, plus 1 is 8. Gamma of 8 is 7 factorial. Zero less than theta less than one. You could do a lot of you know you could double check that this really is a density. Okay. That this is the right normalization to make this function on zero to one integrate to one and have to multiplication by this number. Okay. So uh, that's it. So I start with the uniform and obtain some other density like this. And the question is where is, one of the questions in your homework is where does this um, density take its maximum? Okay. So I have to maximize this product here. This, this won't affect the maximum, right? This constant. All right. So I have to maximize that product. One hint in order to maximize this is take the log. That's the, that's the, uh, 
because this is maximized if only if the log is maximized, the log is the increasing function. So that helps a little bit. If I want to maximize this function of a, and just uh, take the log first, then maximize the, the log expression. This simplifies a little bit because then you get these uh, powers come out of it. It's not quite as hard to differentiate. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, it's not a hard to differentiate, right? right? This is not a difficult one. Just differentiate with respect to theta, so the derivative equal to zero. It's alpha theta. What's your guess? Where do you think it's going to be maximized? X over n. At x over n, yeah. You figure that, okay, that this density now is going to have a peak at uh, 13 over 20. Okay. And this beta density has a property that um, as, uh, as n goes very large and x over n goes to a constant like 0.65 or something like that, then you actually get a delta function. Okay. So in other words, if you kept getting 65% heads, which is impossible each time, but let's just say you did, then you would just converge to it. You get n larger and larger and larger, you would just get a delta function here. Okay? So your pulse theory density would go like that. So that would give you waves. And well, I don't know if they is, but it's pretty close to 0.65. Okay? So, but we have to keep the x and the n, right? When we do the log. We don't. Yeah, okay, so I, I, I plug in x here. Yeah. So the whole point is that x is a constant mm -hmm. when you actually maximize this into theta. Yeah. So that's the thing that bothers, you know, you, you would put your x here, so you put your x here, and you put your n minus x here, mm -hmm. and now you fix edit, and then you fix n as a constant, x as a constant, mm -hmm. and take the maximum in theta. Yeah, so it, it pays to look at the examples a little bit and actually work out what this is actually saying. This changes, right? This is all a bunch of junk, and x factorial and stuff. It's ugly, right? What's the variable? The variable is theta. X is fixed, all right? So this was seven. This was thirteen. I'll put it back, so the recording will be up to date. <laughs> okay. Other comments about this? So what if I started with a different density? I think that's what I did in the notes. Suppose I start with a, um, suppose I start with a beta density. How does this change? Suppose my prior is instead a beta density. Maybe that's interesting. Suppose I take, let, instead of the uniform prior, let's take, uh, let's change the prior, change same example, but change the prior density to, to uh, a gamma density itself, g of theta uh, let's say, let's take f of theta equal to uh, gamma of 6 over gamma of 3 times gamma of 3 um, theta squared, 1 minus theta squared. Okay. Corresponding to, let's say, toss the coin four times, and I got two heads and two tails. Okay. Then that would be my posterior <laughs> density. So suppose I plugged that in. Suppose I did a real simple experiment. I just toss the coin four times. All right. And I get two heads and two tails. Okay. So now this would be my new prior information, I can say, right, for my prototype experiment. And now I do the bigger experiment and toss more points, <laughs> okay. So how is this going to update? It sort of makes sense that you might think about it. If I started, <laughs> if I did some more tosses and I had started with that uniform prior, then I still have to get a gamma in the end, right? I mean the gamma, a, a beta, a beta in the end. So therefore, if I start with a beta, I should get another beta, right? So how does that work? It'll be working exactly the same way, except uh, I have this is the same. Well, the n choose x is the same. 
and then I'll, instead of multiplying by one, instead of multiplying by one, I multiply by this gamma of six over gamma of three, gamma of three, theta squared, one minus theta squared, and then I'll have to integrate here. I'll have to put nothing. I have to integrate. What I get? Theta x plus two, n minus x plus two d theta. And then I have my gamma of six, my gamma of three, gamma of three here also, because that's part of this numerator. I'm going to integrate the numerator. Okay. So all these gamma things go away, and n choose x goes away. And now I have a equals x plus 3, b equals n minus x plus 3. And a plus b is the sum of those, which is n plus 6. And so then I get theta to the x plus 2, n minus x plus 2, gamma n plus 6 over gamma of x plus 3 and minus x plus 3. So it's again, the density of h x equals 0 to n. So now I have to take n equals to 10 and give me some number for x. Okay. If I take now x equals to 6, so that I get, then all total, what did I have? Let's say I got x equals to 6 heads now on 10 tosses. After I had that prior, then what do I get? Then, then this density becomes, let's just go ahead and play with this game all the way through to the end. Okay. Then this game becomes, so I get x equals to 6, then uh, what do I get? Then I get theta to the eighth, one minus theta to the let's say ten minus six is four plus two is six. Okay. Uh, gamma of sixteen over gamma of um, nine, gamma of um, seven. It is here. Okay, that's my beta density. Okay. And uh, now where is the density maximized? Well, now it's like I had eight heads, right? Out of the total of 10 plus four, which was 14 tosses. So it's just eight, so it's as if I just took all the heads that I had already. I was thinking of having two heads, and then I get six more. Okay, so now I have a total of eight heads out of 14 tosses. So it's, it's maximized at eight over 14. Theta equals 8 over 14. Alright, so once you start with beta, you end with beta. Okay? And you start with uniform. I guess uniform can be thought of as beta with alpha equal to 1, and with a equal to 1, and, and b equal to 1, right? So that actually was the particular beta density. Right? The uniform is itself. Now you've seen the beta a little bit in a Bayesian inference problem. Questions or comments now about conditional distributions, conditional methods? What else do I stick in these notes? I think I put in the joint normal. I'm going to skip that for now, I said. But why don't we go on to the next things?
the next thing is to play around with this uh, joint density just a little bit more. Uh, he's going to just play around with it for a couple more sections. <laughs> um, and that, the next thing to do is if we took it, we talked a little bit about transforming a random variable, a univariate random variable. We talked about changing the density. Everybody should recall that method. Then we have a transformation of a random pair. How do I transform a random pair? So in other words, how do I get the distribution of x plus y given that I have the density of x and the density of y? Excuse me, given the joint density of x and y, how would I get the distribution of x plus y? Or the product of a quotient or some other sort of function of x and y. That comes in handy occasionally. Uh, so he's got he's gonna go back through that method and then he's gonna show you uh, some special things. Like we take x and y independent with the distribution of the sum of squares, for example, two independent standard normals, x squared plus y squared. This is, this is the density of that. Some special information. Uh, and then what about if you take the, uh, the sum of two independent exponentials? What's the uh, density of that? Turns out that it exists. <laughs> okay. So, transforma uh, transformations of a random pair, x and y. Or transformation. Let's see. So, I'm going to focus on the sum, x plus y, when I talk about actually transforming the random pair. And that's what the author's going to do mostly, too, is focus on the sum. I think he does something with the quotient, but you can skip that. Um, now, maybe I should recall how you actually do it with uh, the purposes of this, this talk, how you actually go back and transform um, a single using the density method. How, what was the density method? There's a distribution method and a density method. I illustrated both of them, I think. So let's go back to transformation of a single random variable. Oh, x. OK, I suppose, so the example is, uh, and this is one we skipped earlier. Suppose I take um, uh, x is standard normal, All right? And let's take uh, the transformation to be w equals x squared. Okay, define this. Okay, what's the density? What's the distance? What's the density of w? There's two methods. One methods. One is the distribution function method. And method two is the density, direct density method. Now, usually the density method is only good is only directly applicable if it's a, if it's the one to one function that's being discussed. This is w equals g of x equals x squared. That's my transformation. It's the square function that I'm transforming by. That's not a one to one function on the whole line. Before, when we applied it, it was okay because x was a positive random variable. I think we talked about the square function when x was a positive random variable. But here, x is between minus infinity and infinity. That's what little the density of f of x is one over the square root of two pi e to the minus x squared over two minus infinity less than x less than infinity. That's the density of the standard normal.
So how would I actually get the density of capital W? Or what was it? Just the, the author shows the distribution function. How did that go? You would say uh, method one. The method one is you take the f sub w of little w. So you fix little w, which is obviously going to be non-negative. Okay, here. Because w is not a negative thing. And you actually, this is the probability that capital W is less than the little w. All right, so little w is fixed. Then you go ahead and you can, and you write that as probability that capital X squared is less than the little w. You just go ahead and write this probability out like that. And then you try to solve for what that probability is. You integrate the original density over a region that is defined by that expression, x squared less than equal to w. Little w is fixed. So let's see, that means x is going to be minus square root of w plus the square root of w, right? Okay, so then you would go ahead and integrate, but by symmetry, since x is a symmetric random variable, x is this good old symmetric density, I'm just going to go ahead and use the symmetry now. The standard normal curve, bell curve, is the density. Original function. So I need to integrate that from minus square root of w to square root of w. Because to get a probability, you integrate the density, right? So this is equal to integral minus square root of w to square root of w. A lot of calculus in this book. Uh, 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Now I'm just going to go ahead and use the symmetry that's twice integral of 0 to the square root of w, 1 over the square root of 2 pi, u to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Okay, so that's the distribution function. Now I can't write that down explicitly because I can't do the integral. But how would I find the density? That I can find by differentiating this integral by the fundamental term of calculus. So therefore, the little f sub w of w is equal to the derivative of that, d by dw, of this expression, twice the integral from 0 to square root of w, 1 over square root of 2 pi. My squiggles are getting worse and worse. Hope the camera can still read them. Okay. Uh, e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. So I have to take the derivative. And I'd simply, uh, from calculus, I know that there's a 2, then I, I put the square root of w in here into the expression on the integrand, so it's e to the minus w over 2. And then I have to differentiate the square root of w. Because uh, that's the chain rule. Uh -huh. I think you just put that right there. Right into here? Yeah. Because that's, I'm using the, the, the fundamental term of calculus. Integral a to x f of t dt. If I do this, d by dx like that, mm -hmm. it comes out to be f of x. Remember that from count one? So I have an upper vari a variable upper limit of integration and a fixed lower limit of integration. Mm -hmm. I have some integrand f of t here. This is how, this is the rate of change of the area of the curve. A to X. Remember that good stuff? And the picture would help you. A, and then I've got X. Oh, okay. This area is increasing as X gets bigger. What's the exchange rate of change? Just the height of the curve. Right? Well, that's what this comes out to be. Yeah. Plug this in here, algebraically, get the height of the curve. All right? The, but because it's not, uh, this is not varying at rate 1. Okay? And differentiate this. Okay? That's the chain rule. So, 
Uh, let's see, that gives me a one half w to the minus one half. That's how you differentiate the square root. So that that one half is going to kill this two. So I finally get one over the square root of two pi. A one uh, a w to the minus one half. That's e to the minus w over two. W greater than zero. If this calculation is correct, which I hope it is, and it should be verified because there was this was done in chapter two. Yeah, there it is. It's on page sixty one. This is the density. This is the density. And it's called the density of chi square of one degree of freedom. So one means one degree of freedom. That's going to come up in our second half of the course when we start working with statistics, which we have chi squares running around. Here's the density of a chi-square of one degree of freedom. So that's what the level of this course is going to make sure you actually know what the heck that density is. He's not just going to write it in some, you know, appendix somewhere. Okay, over there. He's going to actually make you derive it. Okay. That's the end of this course. <laughs> okay, and that's the way this course is set up. So, not Okay, so what's the density method is 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 a different style of method uh, where I think I mentioned it before, instead of actually using this distribution function and then taking its derivative, I just say, well, think about dots on the x-axis being converted, which I'm thinking of by sampling. Okay, same thing here on the x-axis. Being converted, so now I'm going to have w equals g of x plot. Okay? And then I'm going to convert those to dots on the w-axis. Obviously, there's a lot of dots down here because there's a lot of dots near the origin here. So that means there's going to be a lot of low w's and like this. Okay? So there's going to be dots to the w-axis. Well, if I think about it in simulation terms like that, then um, how, is it, how is the density interpreted? If I, had, if I take a small dx here, then I get a certain pot of dots, right? <laughs> a pot of dots. Those dots are going to be converted over to some infinitesimal interval over here on the w axis. You get a pot of dots. It's the same number of dots. Okay, let's spread out here. But actually, there's two sources of the dot because these will also be into those dots. It's not a one to one function. Okay? So here's x. And here's minus x. They both map to w. Okay. So, so w is x squared, right? Yes, w is x squared. Okay. So all of these dots and all of these dots go into that dot. So what do we have is that f sub w of little w dw, which is the percentage of all the dots, basically equal to the number of dots you can think of. After I multiply by a capital N for the total number of dots. Right. So this roughly represents just how many dots are there. After I multiply by the total volume of dots. Right. Total volume of dots times that is actually the number of dots in this pot. That's going to be, therefore, because there are two sources of dots coming in there, f sub x and minus x dx plus f sub x and x dx. Dx is just a fixed quantity. All right. Dx is a positive quantity here. Right. I could put, maybe put a dw like this in order to make it clear. That's the derivation when it's a two to one function. All right. So actually, there's two sources of the dots. So then that's it. Okay. That's the formula. And now you just have to figure out what dw is and so on. What's dx dw? You divide both sides by dw and you get dx dw. So what you do is you put this over here, and so then you f sub w of w is f sub x. We have to figure out what the minus x is in terms of w, but that's just minus the square root of w. Okay? And then f sub x, f square root of w. And then you have dx dw, absolute value. And 
So I either have x equals the square root of w or x equals minus the square root of w that I have to uh, differentiate. But either way, I'm going to get the same dx dw after the absolute value. So I have to differentiate the square root of w, which that's the one over the two square roots of w again. So this is the one over the two square root of w. So just plug all this in. And so here's where the 2 comes from. You can see if it came here, it's going to be reproduced here. Okay. So I get um, this is equal to 2 with the square root of 2 pi, e to the minus w over 2 times 1 over 2 square root of w. And so you get what you have here for. Oh, no. W greater than 0. OK. So these two sources of dots corresponds to the symmetry here. Okay. Well, anyway, that's the density method. And there is now, okay, there's always a distribution function method. Suppose now I go to the transformation of a random pair. I want to go and see how do I generalize two random variables? How do I do that? How would I transform the density method? Well, that's a little tricky. Because, you see, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take, suppose now I give you, uh, I'm going to sort of kind of, I don't know if it's worthwhile to do the general, I think you have to do a general case first for the sum. So I'm going to go back now and do the distribution function method. For calculating the density of the sum, capital Z equals x plus y, okay, given the joint density f of x, y. Little f x, y of the random pair, capital X, capital Y. So I'm not assuming independence of the capital X and capital at this point. I just want a general formula. Let's go back and go to the distribution function method. Now, I may be pushing a little bit more than I need to on this material because it really, uh, you should see it, but uh, we're going to spend a whole lot of time on it, I think. I think that's why I'm not going to make you do quotients. I'm only going to make you do sums. All right. So let's only do. Let's not go crazy. But let's see what they're talking about. How would I actually do the random pair? Well, uh, so I have z. So I, I use the distribution function method. Let's go back to that one. That seems at least reasonable. It wasn't that difficult. Neither was a density method. Well, let's just see. Uh, what is this? What am I doing an integral sign for? Well, uh, this is a probability <laughs> that x plus y is less or equal to z. Now, that's a probability. So what you do, z, little z is fixed. Little z is fixed. So what this is, this is this, this, this defines a region in x, y space for uh, that I'm going to integrate over. Right? Here's x plus y equal to little z. And then this gives me a region, x plus y less than or equal to z. Okay, back here. That's the region I'm going to integrate the joint density over. So that means I'm going to integrate, take the double integral of the joint density, and integrate over that region. This is the region set of x, y, such that little x plus little y is less than the z. And that z is fixed. So how can I write that out? I could write that out. I have to do my double integrals, right? For each x between minus infinity and infinity, let's see. For each x between minus infinity and infinity, how do you work that out? 
how do you actually integrate over this region? So here's my x, and well, that means that uh, y has to go from minus infinity to wherever it ends up here, right? So with it z minus y? y goes, uh, x is fixed now because it's the outer integral. I want to do the inner integral. Yeah. So uh, y goes from minus infinity. I'm in the inner integral now. So x is on the outer integral. x went from minus infinity to infinity. Mm -hmm. It freeze x now. And let y go from minus infinity to wherever it comes up here, which is y equals z minus, minus x. Yeah. Minus x. Yeah. Fx. So that's a distribution function. Now, if only I could differentiate that thing, but that looks kind of nasty. How do I differentiate that with respect to z? It must be a way. But <laughs> um, you can see this is essentially a sum. Actually, it's not too difficult to differentiate. Maybe we should just do it by hand here instead of going to the chain of variables that does this longer. Basically, you think of this as a sum here. So for each x, that's just z minus x, right? So I can pass the derivative with respect to z across this outer integral. Is everybody following with that? This is like basically a sum. x goes from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, x what? Okay, uh, you know, there's a delta x or something over here, delta x, and then I have integral of minus infinity, y goes from minus infinity to z minus x naught. Okay, f x y <laughs> dy. Okay, so so what I'm going to do is to differentiate with respect to z, I'm going to take, this is this is just a bunch of different upper limit, upper limit of integration is z minus 1 or z minus 2 or z minus 3 and so on. This is the sum we multiply by delta x over here. Okay, so what? All right? That obviously you can bring into the derivative too, that, that this commutes with the differentiation. Okay? So you vary and see how does this change. So I'm going to get that f d by dz, f sub, I'm going to do it a quick way instead of changing variables, is equal to integral minus infinity to infinity dx of d by dz, f x, I mean, this inner integral is the one I want, minus infinity to z minus x. So you think of x as being a fixed number now, okay, like 1 or 2 or 3. So how do I differentiate that little guy in the middle? This is called passing the derivative across the interval. You see that there was no z dependence at all in this outer interval. It was just a sum, linear combination of these inner intervals, linear combination of these inner intervals. Were the upper limit of integration? Yes, it did depend on the x, but that does, you know, that's just okay. And now, I need to differentiate this. Well, um, I just use a chain rule again. I put the z minus x in for y. And then I differentiate z minus x with respect to z, and I just get 1. So this does come out to be integral minus from k to infinity, f of x, z minus x. Um, that was the inner integral. That's the inner, that's the derivative on the inside. Okay? Then I have my dx. Okay. And so that's the that is what I'm doing is I'm I'm taking a uh, not the function f of x and y and integrating out x. I'm taking the function f of x comma z minus x and integrating out x. So I actually have a pretty interesting function of uh, x and z here, right? And integrating out x. Different function of x and z. It's not just f of x and z, it's f of x and z minus x. Okay. Integrate out x, and that's the density of z. Right? So this is x of z. So we have a nice little formula for it. The only trick was that I had to differentiate that integral. Now in the notes, I followed exactly his method, the author's method, for change, making a change of variables first to get this integral on the outside. So you wouldn't have to change the integrals. What you do is you first make a change of variables. So that this becomes an integral over a rectangle, and then you just switch by Fabini's there. Okay, and then you can differentiate the outer integral, and you just get that as the inner integral. So it's a little bit more involved. I think this is a little bit more direct. Okay? Question. Why can't you just 
pull them straight in and just do it this way? I just did. Yeah, it's but fine. Like, okay. It's fine. You just have to know how. You have to have conditions under which you can actually pass the cross interval sign. He didn't want to broach that question. Oh. There are certain conditions and theorems in which you can actually do that operation. Because there's a limit here, right? Uh, it's a limit of a sum. Okay. Uh -huh. so you actually can't. You, you do it. Limits don't always commute. Okay. So I'm taking one limit, the derivative limit, across this other limit in the process. So I have to take handle with care. But there can be no problem here. So we're just, of course, like a mathematical I or a physicist or whatever. You don't worry about it. You just go ahead and do it. It works fine. Okay? The calculus, you know your calculus. All right? <laughs> So, you don't have to prove to somebody you know your calculus. There it is. So, then apply it. Maybe. Let's take it to the sum of two. Let's go ahead and take the sum of two. Um, let's take those chi squares, maybe. Okay. Is that what I wanted? Yeah. So, let's take, uh, let's take um, t equals... Uh, x squared plus y squared. Ooh, we're out of time. Example t equals x squared plus y squared for x and y independent. Uh, n zero one. Then the densities are uh, one of the square root of two pi. Uh, so f of x, f of x and y. It's going to be a product of these chi-squared densities. So now, so basically, f, f uh, let's call this u plus v. So f of u will be where u, f, all right, and g equals u plus v for x, y, infinite, in zero, one. I know what the densities are. So it's f sub u of u times f sub v of v, all right, for the chi-square u and a chi-square v that are independent. I already worked out what u and v were, right? I don't know if you remember that. Just a moment ago, I had my capital u and my capital v densities written down. That was 1 over the square root of 2 pi. One over, uh, that was u to the minus 1 half, v to the minus u over 2, and 1 over the square root of 2 pi, v to the minus 1 half, e to the minus v over 2. And this was a u and v greater than 0. So I plug in this formula, what do I get? So what's the density of t now? Uh, equal to the sum of the squares of those two uh, standard normals, independent. So I'll we'll get integral minus the figure infinity, uh, f, I guess I'm putting in u and v instead of x and y, okay? u and z minus u, du, all right? And so, let's see. Of course, now this is only defined for u and v greater than zero, so u is going to be greater than zero. Okay, so this is going to be integral if u goes to something, but also z minus u has to be greater than zero. So this is going to be u greater than zero, z minus u greater than zero. You have to, when you have, um, you have to say, well, my, my conditions are u greater than zero and z minus u greater than zero, and z is fixed. So what does this mean? u greater than zero and z minus u greater than zero. Or u less than z. Yeah, z greater than z, z, u. But z is fixed, so that means u less than z. Okay, I'll, and I'll just plug all this junk in. I'll have a 1 over 2 pi, uh, u to the minus 1 half, v to the minus 1 half, uh, e to the minus u over 2, e to the minus v over 2. Okay. U, u, v. Actually, u. Oh, so v is now a little uh, c, minus c minus u. Isn't that nice? D U U. Okay, guess what? The exponential goes away. This minus and minus U cancels with this business. So there's no exponential even minus U in there. Beautiful. Okay? This is integral. U goes from 0 to Z. That's all there is left. D U. And then I have 1 over square root of 2 pi. Excuse me, 1 over 2 pi. Then I have uh, U to the minus 1 half, V to the minus 1 half. And then I'm going to have an e to the minus z over 2 out in front. Okay? Well, that's, I'm sorry, not z. E to the minus z. My v, v is 
is also z minus u. I'm sorry, that one did have to come in there. Z minus u to the minus one half. Okay. How do you do the how do you do the integral? What do you do here? How do you do this? What function of z is there? Can you just multiply it out and it'll be easier to multiply? Oh, I can't multiply it out, unfortunately, because okay. of that doesn't spell. Okay. Um, it's in the notes. I gave you the notes. Okay, we're done today. Um, let me give you the copies of the notes at least. Um, note six. How do you do that interval? Well, that's that beta integral again. I need to make a change of variables, right? It's just I'll make it on the interval zero to one by change by. Uh, Replacing u by uh, u over c, right? So theta um, equals u over c. So I make the substitution theta equals u over c. Okay, and then that's going to kill all that. This is, this is just going to give me one of those beta integrals. I'll come out with it. But the upshot is that the z dependence goes out. Okay, the z dependence is going to go out. Because there's a negative one half. Um, if it, that means that that z theta is equal to u, right? So I get a z to the minus one half coming here. I'm also going to get a z to the minus one coming here. But du is z d theta. So all the z's are going to go out, and this is going to be a constant. So actually, this does not depend on z. In fact, it comes out to be therefore this comes out, and all this gamma of one half and all that junk cancels the pi. And I simply get one half e to the minus z over two, z greater than zero, all right, which is a exponential density with parameter one half. <laughs> okay. So now you know that a chi square of two degrees of freedom is exponential with parameter one half. Little things <laughs> to put in your library of knowledge. Oh wow. So I think this is probably all we really want to do. You have to do one on your homework. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of calculus. Good question. How did you come up with zero to z? Okay, there was this business again. Yeah. That. Let's go through this again. I know it's kind of hurried. I have to integrate this. Uh -huh. F of u z minus u from uh, minus infinity to infinity in u. In u. In u. Just du. Uh -huh. But now, so I have to plug all the stuff in. But that means that the but now f, that means I'll plug in this expression and replace v by z minus u, right? All right. Well, I'll find dandy, right? But then I'll. But that's a zero a lot of times, right? This is zero if I'm not in the first quadrant of the plane of the uv plane. See what? If this is zero. This density is actually zero if I'm not in the first quadrant of the uv plane. Uh -huh. Right? Here's UV plane, and it's, it's this number in here, but it's zero everywhere else. So what happens when I put in two numbers here, then I have to check that they're both in the, in the first quadrant. Okay? Well, that means U has to be positive, and also Z minus U has to be positive. Okay. Well, that means that U has to be less than Z. So U has to be positive and less than Z, so that means U only goes from zero to Z in this calculation. Yeah, that's the trick of this formula. It's not that easy to apply. <laughs> okay, that's why you need to see it at least once or twice. All right, now you try it. Okay. All right. We'll see you next time.